but let's jump in, folks. Um, we're going to try to make the most out of this hour that we have together, folks. So we're going to do three big things. One, we're going to just get you off into breakout rooms for just a few minutes, just to like be able to get to know each other a little bit in very small rooms for about four minutes, uh, for about seven minutes, actually. And then after that, I'm going to spend maybe 20 minutes max, just like trying to give you a, a bit of you know, where we are with the incubation and, and what we believe and what underlies some of that. And then we're going to keep the rest of the time for Q&A. Um, and so that's a little bit of how we'll use this time. Our is to use the, the latter half of this just for Q&A um, and then to be able to move from there. Um, thank you so much for all of you that turned on your videos. Um, it's good to see so many faces and it's good to have so many of you here. Um, so give me 30 seconds. Here we go. We're gonna get us started with one quick question. Um, and this question's gonna carry us over into the breakout rooms. Um, all of you are here, I am presuming, because you aspire to build something that's transformational for kids. Um, you're all here because you're thinking about like, you know, what's that new kind of school that really is going to, you know, be transformational and be life-changing and, and reinvent how we think about school today. And so that is my question for you that we're going to go off into breakout rooms with. When you think about that new kind of school, that institution that you've been envisioning, that you've been going back and forth with in your mind, that you've been like, maybe vaguely for some of you, maybe more concretely, but that's been ruminating. Well, what is it? What's the representation of that? What's the image that comes up? What is the new kind of school that you want to build? We're going to hop, get you off into breakout rooms. Seven minutes, you're going to be in a group of four. So we're going to keep it really snappy and really short. And then we will see you back here in seven minutes. So in breakout rooms, what is the new kind of school you want to build? You'll each have about a minute and a half to share. And then we're going to come right back here and we're going to take a step forward. I'll see you back here in seven minutes. We've got a perfect um, people joining in. Awesome. Welcome back, folks. Um, I see you have a hand raise. Yes, Ramja, do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah uh, did you really get like seven minutes inside? I don't think because our um interaction got uh, like uh, heated up and then only like uh, we were sharing something we came and then like uh, in between and then uh, like um, we are back to the main room yeah i'm sorry, sorry but then i'm very open like that's why i just mentioned it i'm sorry no, no, please, is, thank uh, you. yeah i'm sorry that it felt rushed um but our hope is to be able to spend a lot more time diving into these ideas and diving into to a lot of these visions, you know, and and like we are here because we are excited about the potential of those visions. Um, and our hope is to be able to go deeper into them with you. But thank you for engaging with us, even though it did feel a little bit rushed. And, and thank you for surfacing that. Um, so folks, four things we're gonna leave you with today, right? Before we jump into Q&A. And one of those is I'm gonna leave you with the story. And that's my story. And the second I'm going to leave you with is a case for reinvention. I'm going to try to offer you a little bit of what we believe. And then I'm going to try to give you a bit of a preview into the journey of the circle as we are a day away from actually concluding our first year of operations, right? And that journey will then give you a little bit more into what the incubation will offer. After this, I'm just going to open it up for Q&A. Pooja, Aisha, Priya, and myself will just be here to be able to answer questions and we'll just hold space for a little bit with any questions that folks have, yeah. Um, but to start off with my story, um, so these are the kids that I actually taught and these are the kids that have probably kept me in this work uh, for the better part of 17 years and this was 17 years ago. Um, and these were the kids that I actually first taught in Washington, DC as a seventh and eighth grade science teacher um, in a low income school in the heart of the District of Columbia, um, not too far away from where I grew up. Um, I will never forget my first day of teaching. Um, I was going into school and 
I actually opened up a, a leading newspaper of the Washington Post. And on the front page of that Washington Post of the education section was a headline that I'll never forget. And I actually went up and I actually looked up this headline in preparation for this. And it said this, it said, huge achievement gaps persist in DC schools. And when you actually looked right below this, another headline came up. And that headline says, Susa Middle School, school that I taught at was called Susa Middle School, robs kids of the education they need and deserve. And I frantically read through this and I'm reading through the rest of this paper and I'm trying to basically find out like, I'm about to go teach. Keep in mind, like put yourself in my shoes for a second. I'm about to go teach in 60 minutes in this school. And I'm looking at this headline that basically says the school that I'm going to quote, robs kids of the education they need and deserve. And I'm reading through this article. And as I get further through it, I basically read that, well, three out of 10 kids from Susa will actually graduate. And two out of 10 kids, statistically speaking, are likely to make it through college. And I remember walking into that classroom that morning, and I'm looking out at these 40 boys actually that were my first class of the day. I had 120 minute, 120 students that, that day, that year. And I'm looking at these 40 kids and I'm thinking like, wait a minute, which ones are actually gonna make it? And which eight will actually make it all the way through? And I remember thinking how dark that felt and how sad that made me that day. This was the school that I taught at, folks. Yeah, there were 238 schools in the District of Columbia and Sousa Middle School actually ranked 238 out of 238 on safety. It ranked 237 out of 238 on academics and it had about 25 teachers. And so what this meant was that for 12 straight years, kids actually just really weren't learning a lot. What this meant was that like every single day we had kids actually getting arrested. What this meant was that every single day I was actually breaking up about three to four fights, right? In between my first and my second year, I thought I was going to quit. And I went to the principal and, you know, we said, look, like, we just don't think we can do this anymore. Would you allow us to be able to step in and try to take things over and actually help out? And so we, we, we took this call where we actually took over a large portion of the school. What that meant was that we redesigned curriculum, we retrained teachers, we rethought student discipline, we rethought student curriculum. We basically did everything. And our kids that next year saw about 25% of growth. And we're about to finish the two-year fellowship that we were on. And the district actually made a pretty big call. And that call was that they actually let go of the principal. And they said, this school does not actually seem fit to run. We're going to basically shut this school down. We're going to let go of the principal and we're going to reopen it with different leadership and with the third of the teachers that were new. Very controversial call, right? Lots of people actually weren't happy and it was very disruptive. And, and it was actually just like any call like that that's so tough is not going to be an easy one to take. Fast forward 14 years. And this is where the school was at as of 2020. 28 out of 238 on safety, 36 out of 238 on academics, 25% increase in reading and math. It was a little bit of a drop from where it was. Before that, it was actually at number 12 for a while. But when you look at where that was compared to 2006, look at the jumps. And so the question is, what's underlying that? Why do I tell you this story to start off with? Well, I think it's because it's left me with a couple of big things that honestly have fueled why I continue to do this work today and have fueled a lot of basically how I approach this work. Well, one is it taught me that schools matter, right? Like schools can be either highly catastrophic for kids or they can be transformational for kids. And we have examples of both. But it also taught me that leadership matters, right? Like the people within a school matter so, so much. And the truth is that the people leading schools 
matters so much. But it also taught me that examples matter. See, examples hold the power to be able to basically change what people believe is possible with kids. And every example of a transformational school that we have, like has the potential to really be able to shift what people think is possible. And that matters so much because that changes the conversation about what kids, especially kids from disadvantaged backgrounds are capable of when you change the conversation. And over the years, folks, I have been reminded of this truth over and over again. I was reminded just last week when we were in the UK with our entrepreneurs and we were visiting schools and I saw this school and I saw this incredible example of a school working predominantly with kids coming from low-income backgrounds and sitting there looking at kids learning at high levels, receiving actually one of the best examples of an education that I've seen. And I thought to myself, wow, like this example where hundreds of kids in this school are receiving something transformational, it matters. I thought about that when I was in high tech high, a school in San Diego about two months ago. And I walked out thinking like, wow, this school is just shifting what people think kids can do. And that matters. That matters, especially when you think about the fact that 60% of the kids in this school come from low income backgrounds. Like it matters because it shifts what kids think they're capable of, and it shifts what adults think kids are capable of. I think about that right here in India. And I think about that when I look across our educational system. And I look at the fact that it feels like we are very, very far away from where we need to be. I think about that when I look at what happened through the pandemic, what things like the USER report continue to tell us about kids across the country. And I think about it when I think about the fact that, wow, like we have a long way to go. And when I step back on that, I don't think, oh my gosh, we're going to be able to basically change the educational outcomes for 260 million students overnight. What I instead think about is that every example of success that we can put into the ecosystem matters because it changes what people believe is possible. What examples do is they change the conversation. That's the story. And so here's a case for reinvention. Well, Gallup, an organizational survey, and some of you have engaged with me, have actually like engaged with this before. And if you have, I'm going to actually do a bit of a rejog of your memory. They do this survey every single year, and they've been doing this survey for 60 straight years. And the first time they started doing the survey was in 1963. And they ask employers across the world one question. What are the top three skills that kids graduating should have as they enter the workforce. I'm gonna say it again. What are the top three skills that kids graduating should have when they enter the workforce? Here's my question to you. Come on over to the chat box. Think everybody, please. Over to the chat box. What do you think employers said in 1963, 60 years ago? Top three skills graduates should have as they enter the workforce. Shrey says communication. Good to see you, Shrey. Thank you for that. So communication. What else? What are the top three skills? 1963. I need you to rewind 60 years. Got engineering, academic excellence. Got some counting, writing, speaking. Got some innovation, communication skills, communication, critical thinking, flexibility. Some people actually say like, look, they've wanted the same thing. Confidence, got leadership, empathy, creativity, literacy, and numeracy. So check this out. For those of you who have seen this before, there'll be a recap. But here's what they said back in 1963. They said reading, writing, and arithmetic. And in 1963, what they meant by this, and this was clarified in an article that came out in 63, they said, with arithmetic, they want computational arithmetic. Can you do procedural math? With writing, they said a focus on penmanship, right? All of this made sense in 1963, folks. That was the world that we were living in in 1963. It made sense to say, like, these are the three skills kids have. Fast forward to 2022. What do you think they said 59 years later? What do you think they said? Come back over to the chat box with me. 59 years, and if you basically like know the answer, please put it on over in the chat box. 
59 years later, what do you think they said? Problem solving, memorizing, critical thinking, communication, leadership, innovation, skills, interests, digital literacy, fair, strategic thinking, empathy. It's changed a little bit in 2022. I need to update this image. Basically, they said problem solving. They said critical thinking. They said creativity. And actually in 2022, they actually said cognitive empathy as well, right? Because they felt like cognitive empathy is a precursor to teamwork. What am I getting at with this? Folks, the world has changed in 60 years. The workforce has changed in 60 years. The unfortunate truth is that the vast majority of our schools have it, right? As somebody who's probably spent every single week getting into schools for 14 years since I've been in India, minus the pandemic, I can tell you that 98% of what I observe, not all, but 98% of what I observe is still preparing kids for a 1963 world. So what does it look like when you're able to reimagine that? Well, I think it looks like this school that I saw a while back where they had actually designed the school in collaboration with industry leaders in the state. And industry leaders actually came in. They didn't just come in to input, to volunteer, to fund the school. They actually sat at the table with educators and they said, let's design a school that's going to prepare kids for the workforce today. And what was the results of that design? Well, you had kids actually spending half of their day engaging in academic learnings, because that is important. They were learning concrete skills. And the other half of their day, they were actually engaging in industry-led workshopping where kids were actually engaging with technology. They were shadowing. They were you know, going through apprenticeships. They were doing the things that they needed to do to be able to connect with the industry, right? We have to reinvent. And that's what I'm leaving you with. So what do we believe at the circle then, right? If we know that there is a case for reinvention and that schools need to be redesigned and reimagined so that they are preparing kids for a changing world, the question that underlies that is, well, what do we believe? I want to leave you with four big beliefs that underlie everything that we do at the circle, right? They underlie how we think about this work. And one of those is we believe that education just holds game-changing power for kids from low-income backgrounds. And this is a belief that is supported by enormous amounts of data that says that basically the higher kids get up in attainment of education, the more likely they are to have positive life outcomes, right? We know that when you graduate college, you will actually earn 12 times as much as if you didn't, right? And yet we know that if you come from a low-income background in this country, you have a 3.8% likelihood of actually graduating from college. We also know that 70% of kids drop out before they get to 10. So we have this, this realization that education is game-changing, but we're not yet able to figure out how to get it to the vast majority of kids who need it. We also believe that we have to reinvent our schools. And we believe that we have to reinvent schools so that they are not preparing kids for the past, but that they are preparing kids for the future. We believe that that cannot happen in the current construct of the timetable as we know it. Kids in India today are in school on average for about four, four and a half hours a day. That's it. It is one of the lowest in the world, right? Some private schools have been able to extend that to about seven, but most schools, particularly government schools, are still operating at a four four to four and a half hour level. Kids, in, kids are in school for about 160 days a year. That's it, right? When you do that quantitative comparison to other countries, it's one of the lowest in the world. We have to basically move beyond just the time that basically is within that timetable. We have to figure out how to extend that timetable to get learning to extend. And then finally, we believe when we look at the world around us, that education has to equip our kids to be change makers. Our kids cannot just be recipients of a world that they inherit. Our kids are fully capable. They have everything that they need to be able to change the world. We need to enable and empower them. 
to be changing the world around them, not tomorrow, but today. These four beliefs, folks, I tell you because they underlie everything that we do and everything that we center ourselves in at the circle. I left you with a story. I left you with a case for reinvention and I left you with what we believe. I'm gonna finally, before we open this up for Q&A, as we turn one very shortly, talk you a little bit about our journey and what we've been down to give you a little bit of an info into what the incubation holds. 12 months ago, we launched the circle. And back in November, we formally launched the incubation with 11 entrepreneurs that we have been going down a journey with. And that incubation has been running and folks are basically moving and they have been going down what is a two-year journey to be able to basically reimagine what school could be. And these entrepreneurs, these 11 folks are coming from all walks of life. They're building a STEM school in Delhi. They're building nature-based schools and nature-based after-school programs. They're building an after-school theater production that has kids creating content in Goa. They're building what aspires to be an inclusive school that is socioeconomically integrated, that is serving kids with disabilities and putting them foot to foot with basically kids that would normally be thought of as your mainstream. They include schools that you know, aspire to be a really high quality school in Jalalabad and in Kanpur. They are programs across the country that really are aspiring to reinvent what school could be. And these folks who I just told you about, well, we've been doing a lot over the past six months now. This was us in London last week where we actually went into Summerhill, a school that's fully democratically run. We walked out of the school, I walked out of the school at least feeling very uncomfortable by what I just saw, but also feeling deeply moved and deeply shifted about a school that's done this for a hundred years. They've been spending time workshopping five days every single month trying to come together and workshop so that they're able to really think about how do you build a school or an after-school program step by step. They've been spending time pitching their ideas to potential supporters, to mentors, to potential donors, to thought partners, to program leaders, people who have been sh like showering them with feedback to make sure that they're getting better month on month. They've been spending time visiting schools right here in India, like this school, Absara Academy in Pune, where we spent an entire day in. Every single month, they've been coming together and visiting more and more schools to be able to continue expanding our vision of excellence so that we start to be able to say, actually, I've got a little bit of a sense that's pushing me of what I want to build. That journey is still going, and that journey will continue to be going. And along the way, they've been working with coaches, people who have each launched their own schools and their own after-school programs who are working with them every single week to push them and to say, let's sharpen what your program can be so that it gets better and you are closer and closer to launching. All of that, folks, well, it's rooted in this vision. So like, What would it mean to see things in whole new ways? Because to be able to build a new kind of school, we've got to build a new kind of us along the way. This program, folks, it's been designed in partnership with a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of people who are inputting into this, who are acting as facilitators and coaches and partner organizations and knowledge sharing organizations. A lot of these people are people who have built schools themselves. Some of them have built networks of schools. Some of them have basically spent lifetimes thinking about how do you redesign schools? And all of these folks have come on as partners, as facilitators, as people who are inputting into how do you actually make this program that will then be able to allow folks to be able to push boundaries. And when you pull all of that together, well, it has several components that I've just mentioned. School visits, an apprenticeship where entrepreneurs are spending their time actually learning the ropes for six weeks from a high-performing school, working with coaches, working with networks, right? Going through workshops and training days, engaging with design tools that we're using, Right? And also being able to connect with potential funders along the way right? that may be able to basically help and support. All of that boils down to these three big objectives. Our hope is that the incubation empowers you to design a more innovative school, to be able to launch it, and to be able to know how to run it. Yeah, And that basically spills out over these two years, where year one is all like design, it's all inspiration, it's all concept. And year two, 
is all, well, how do you learn how to run your school? How do you learn how to basically pilot what you're doing? How do you get the ropes of like how to actually get this off the ground and know how do you run it really, really well? The last thing I'm gonna leave you with before I stop, yeah? A lot of folks ask us like, well, what do you look for in an entrepreneur? And truthfully, we don't have like a formula for this. We're not looking for a set of like experiences. We're not looking for like, have you done this, this, and this, right? We are looking for competencies. We're looking for a set of competencies that basically are able to say like, you're ready to start and you actually could get this off the ground and figure out how to launch it with our support. Yeah. At the heart of that though, we're really looking to see like, are you rooted in these four big commitments? And this will be the last thing I leave you with. And those are what we call the commitment to equity. Are you committed to actually serving kids that are coming from low income backgrounds? The commitment to community, are you committing to basically designing this in partnership with kids, with family members, with the other entrepreneurs? The commitment to a holistic vision, are you committed to developing a vision for kids that is not just academics, but also that is not just socio-emotional? That is all of it together, because that's what we know is transformational for kids. And finally, are you committed to results? Which basically means, are you committed to basically measuring what you are doing so that it is getting you better for kids over time? I'm gonna pause. Um, said I take about 20, I think I'm right at time, a little about two minutes over. And we're gonna open the rest of this space to be able to basically just hold some time for Q and A um, and then be able to go from there. I should have a quick like live question for you that I know that, that I am wondering, do we wanna break people off into two groups or do we wanna be able to do it all together here? Is Asha still with us? Oh, there she is, yeah. Yeah. Um, we could do that. Uh, let's, uh, we could break off into two groups um, and perhaps the co-host could then jump after 10 minutes if, if it's needed. Uh, but Pooja, maybe you could lead one of the groups and we could have some repeat the other and I can break Perfect. you out into two. Yeah. All right, let's do that so that everybody gets a chance. Come back here in about 25 um, and we'll spend the next 25 minutes off in groups and then we will bring this to a close. All right. Oh. You can take room one, would you? Okay, got it. Okay. I'll go into group one? Yeah. Perfect. See you shortly. We just um and so like you know reach out to one of us I'm gonna put my email id and i'll ask my team members to do the same but reach out so basically one of us um we will schedule a conversation with you right like that's like that's that's our, our commitment back is if you basically want to talk about some of this like you can reach out to one of the three of us and like we will like engage in a conversation we'll be happy to basically talk happy to basically answer more questions. And so Potter's Wheel, I'm not sure what your name is, but we're happy to talk. Um, and anybody else that basically is out there, we are more than happy to talk. Like we want to engage and we see this as like a collaborative process to say, can we partner with you to be able to support you? Um, so thank you all. Um, we're excited to be able to go through your applications. We're excited to continue engaging and we're excited to hopefully partner with you. Um, have a good evening folks. And thank you all for coming out. Yeah, take care everybody. I just wanted to share one last note before you leave so that you have something uh, to uh, answer some of your questions. 
uh, here. I've shared two things. One is the document itself, which is your application support document. It has all the questions that you will likely face during your application um, in one place. We recommend that you kind of go through it and mull it over, maybe build a running document separately. And then as and when you're ready, just like put uh, the, the responses in the actual type form. I've also shared a link uh, to that blog. So if, if you cannot for some reason download it now, um, on the Circle India website, and this is for anybody who will be watching the recording as well, on the Circle India website, in the blog section, we have a blog which talks about the applications being open, and that also has this document which has the link to all the application questions, the link to the application itself, and the link to the FAQ document, which a lot of them turn out to be um, you know, common amongst uh, everyone. So once you're, you, you're, you, know, you have that clarity, you can also continue to kind of reach out to us for some of the trickier questions um, so that you're ready uh, to kind of, you know, share um, your application with us. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for that, Actually, Have a good evening, folks. Get some rest this weekend and uh, just shoot us a mail if you want to talk. Thank you all, thank you. Thank you, bye. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye.